Hey, Scott, do you know what the sound of this is? <laughs> Sounds like my stomach last night. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you feeling okay? Yeah. A little travel bug? No, it was post-travel. It was bitchin' sauce. You know that bitchin' sauce? I don't, no. Oh, well. I ate some old bitchin' sauce. It didn't go well. Uh, bitchin' sauce has a lifespan, huh? You got to watch out for the <laughs> expiration date. Yeah, I actually looked at the expiration date, but apparently you shouldn't eat it uh, five days after opening it. This is a, conver a common conversation we have in our house, too, is... Lauren wanting to throw things out, uh, you know, leftovers, let's say two or three days after yeah. they've gone into the fridge. And I'm like, leave it in there for a week. I'll get around to it. <laughs> I know. It's <laughs> just salad getting... that's been there from Friday. I'll get Whoa. to it. A salad is gnarly. Salad's good. Mango. Huh? Mango salad. Oh, okay. There's yeah. no lettuce, you know? Okay. Yeah. So it's just getting good. It's just getting that's ripe. That's what I feel. Yeah. Let it ferment a little bit even, even better. <laughs> I can see you making wine out of your mango salad. <laughs> Exactly. But hey, you know what will cure all? Yes. What? Oh, I, Athletic Greens. I love that stuff. Athletic slash surf. That's right. Athleticgreens.com slash surf. That is the link you use to order your Athletic Greens. I brought some down on my last trip and um, I shared it with guys that were down there and they were all quite psyched. Good for you, man. Look at you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so essentially for listeners who haven't heard us a couple of times before, 75 minerals and vitamins in a green powder. It's all sourced from New Zealand, organic, kind of the highest quality version of this stuff. And you pour water into it, mix it and drink it daily. It's a daily drink and it covers all of your um, nutritional requirements for the day, essentially. So yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan. And it also has probiotics and um, some enzymes that they've added. It's scientifically designed so that um, everything will be, uh, you know, absorbed into your system and synthesized properly. Bridges the gap between deficiency to optimal nutrition. Athleticgreens.com slash surf. Yes. And then, and then, of course, our fan favorite, neatessentials.com is always with us as well. Wetsuits, outerwear, board shorts, accessories. Yes. I, I had my board shorts in Mexico and I also had my Neat Essentials wet dry bag, which mm. is super killer. I'm, I mean, I love all my things Neat Essentials, but I tell you the, the wet dry bag is, it's great for travel. Totally. Basically, it's basically my carry on and I just throw everything in it and uh, yeah, Neat awesome. Essentials. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for keeping the show in business. Neatessentials.com and athleticgreens.com slash surf. Yeah, man. Welcome to the show. Yeah, guy. Yeah, guy. Welcome, everybody. It is May 19th. It is a Wednesday. Is it the 18th or the 19th? Let me check. 19th. The 19th. And uh, we talk spit. We spitball. We talk surf and we spitball while we do it. Sometimes we spit on the screen. And as always, I'm joined by my co-host, David Scales. David, good morning. Good morning. COVID-friendly spit if it's on the screen. There is no threat to either you nor me if we get a little too unwieldy. Right. The spit can flow much more uh, loosely than it was in the past year and a half. Speaking of the past year and a half, one thing that we have not been able to do is travel. And yet, Scott, you may have just broken the seal back to, uh, back to normal life. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I broke the seal. I think people have been traveling um, a lot, you know. Um, but yeah, so surf travel is back on, I believe. Now, of course, that's easy to stay, say from here, from the safety of a vaccinated, more or less, Southern California, um, where everything's been dropped way down regarding um, benchmarks that need to be hit for us to get back to normal. But there, of course, you know, these, these countries that we're traveling to are actually not doing so great. I don't think they've had access to the vaccination, to the vaccine. And um, so anyway, just do note that when you, when you think that it's all good, it's only all good in the neighborhood. It's not so good in other places. So bear in mind when, you, when you're you know, thinking about where to go. In other so words, was this... you gotta wear, you're gonna have to wear masks and everything yeah. on, on flights and, and when you're out and about in these other countries. So is this a business trip? Of course. 
Gotcha. Yeah, I was Board there. To, I was there to ride surfboards and um, and report on them to you and to others, and uh, and it was great. I I got some great waves. The you know <clears throat> I went down to southern Mexico, and I don't know if you know that area very well, but down in Salina Cruz proper, down in the city where all the surf resorts are down there, they had these really strong gap winds, which is the winds from the Caribbean side that, that blow through occasionally, really, really strong, like 30 knot winds. And um, that's unfortunate because what it means is that each and every one of those surf camps has to drive an hour and a half up to the region where I'm at. So spots that are normally empty now had 30 people or 40 people on them. I literally, the very first morning we surfed, we surfed a spot, a well-known spot that, but it's only well-known because it's, it's, you know, it's easy to get to. It's not a spot that is generally crowded. Again, because those other spots down in Selena Cruz are right there in front of the resorts and they're, they're pretty prime points. They're the ones you see in all the videos. The ones you've seen recently of like Timmy Reyes. Those are all blown to hell. So they all have to drive up. And so the very first morning, we actually surf at the crack because where I stay is very close to where we were. And uh, so we got a good you know, hour, hour and a half in by ourselves, more or less. And then just the onslaught of, of surf tours just showed up truck after truck after truck. And by you know, nine o'clock in the morning, there was 35 or 40 frothing Dudes, it was like Malibu or something. It was ridiculous. Mm. At one point, a, at one point, a truck pulled up with twenty-five people in it. I mean, Whoa. like three, a, a, like three different trucks, twenty-five people, and um, maybe it was less. It might have been fifteen, or it was ridiculous. Though it was ridiculous. Like it was at the point where you're like, if you're this, if you're one of the fifteen to twenty surfers, why would you even get in this car and go to this place with these people? Like, at least the other cars are showing up with six, four, you know, yeah, a, a, like a reasonable number of guys. But to pile out a whole crew of fifteen guys, they were from Maui. Oh my god! And gosh. I just don't. I, I was kind of like dumbfounded by the concept of, you know, like I don't even like to travel with two people yeah actually i do i'll travel with two people me and somebody else but anything more than that to me is like you're stepping over the line mm -hmm. and to pile out with but anyway point is is that luckily the guy that i go with knows knows the area so well that we packed up and we went and i surfed a a beautiful groomed sand bottom point for three days by ourselves it was awesome but despite all those people searching for waves, you were able to find a spot without them? Yeah, these people, these guys don't know what's going on with this spot. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so a couple of questions. Do you have, is anybody shooting videos or photo? Um, and then what boards did you bring and what'd you ride? Uh, there's a couple of photos that just we took with our iPhones while we were in a hammock, you know, like lying around, oh, there's one, of those, you know, like that. There was no professional videos or photos, but I put a couple of photos up on my Instagram account that somebody took of me that are, you know, whatever, they're okay. And um, what did I ride? I, so here's, a, I, I hate traveling with surfboards, <laughs> which is kind of weird, but at this point in my life, I'm like, no. So I actually have a board down there that I can ride, but I did bring a board. I brought one board. And I was sort of struggling to find a board to ride. I'm kind of on a three fin kick these days. Um, I, you know how everything's cyclical. I mean, and yeah, it always and for each for each of us, it's cyclical. And also, on a much grander sort of thirty thousand foot level, it's cyclical for the entire community of surfers. You know, like what's in fashion? Is it mid length? Is it round board? Is it now twin fin? Is it back? And it feels like for me, I'm going back to the tri fin um, because I've been riding twin fins for you know the last couple three or four years and um anyway i but i i saw what i'm getting at is is i tried a bunch of different three fins and the waves here prior to me going on my trip have been horrid 
And so it hasn't offered me the opportunity to get to really know these three fins that I've been wanting to try out, you know, like it's been really bad. And so I wasn't sure which board to take of these three fins. So instead I reached into the depth of my quiver and pulled out one of my absolute loved go-to boards, which is my Wayne Rich B-Dog. And it's actually a four fin, but it has a little space for a, a stabilizer fin, one of those Sean Madison stabilizers. And so I brought that board because I rode that board and I went, why am I even questioning this? Like, this is such a good board. You know how you have one board where you're like, wow, why do I even order any of these other boards? I could literally just ride this board for the rest of my life and be good based on, you know, the surf and my age and where I ride and stuff like that. And um, I absolutely love this board. I have loved it. I mean, I've had this board for whatever, five or six years and it's in great shape. And you may have seen it. It was pink and black. Mm -hmm. It's a pink and black right. Wayne Rich quad. Yeah. And uh, I painted it white actually for this trip because black's not so good down there. But, um, but I took that board and I, that's the only board I rode and I absolutely loved it. And, and I, I still love it. And I'm just, I'm sort of questioning at this point, like, why am I ordering so many boards? Like, why am I searching? I've got a really good board. Um, you said that you have a board down there. You just leave a board with at the same, at the resort that you stay at every time. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and you didn't even ride it. No, no. Hmm. I didn't even look at it. Wow. It's kind uh, of a I, bigger step up. It's not really a good board for those points. It's more of a beach break board. I think people would be surprised to hear that you only travel with one board. Dude, if I could travel with no boards, I would. Yeah. And I have, I have, like when I go to Kelly's or to Waco or whatever, I go with no boards. I just rent a board. Yeah. Because I mean, look, like, you know, I always said, what am I really doing? I'm doing a bottom turn. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of really good boards out there. Like, you know, just your stock. Like when I went to Waco, I used a super brand board. When I would go to um, Lemoore, I I ride one of the Firewires. Um, you know, Dan Mann's got some great boards down there. Um, Tomo, you know, those are great boards. I guess the paradox or the question is like, then why do you have a quiver of 100 surfboards? <laughs> like well, you, you're buying new boards every week, it seems. Every time we record, you have a new board. And you have this giant quiver. And if you could just ride anything at any given time, then what is the point? Well, it, as you know, boards are fun. Boards are unique. To, to try and to, you know, to, to try out different boards is a lot of fun. And each one is actually different. And, and as you know, half of an inch, quarter of an inch change in volume or all of these things make the board react differently. And each and every board is, you know, offers me a different sensation and, and it's fun to ride new boards. And oh, by the way, I'm in the surfboard business. It's my business to kind of know about all of these boards. So that's one of the reasons why I have a lot of boards is that, you know, these are all my clients and I love surfboards and I love surfboard uh, manufacturing. And, and I love the culture and the history of these guys and these boards and this thing, this industry. And so I'm a big supporter and I, I'm going to continue to be. Um, and in fact, the board that I love, that Wayne Rich B-Dog, I reached out to Wayne. I'm like, Wayne, you got to make me another one of these boards. And Wayne, just like everybody else is all backed up. Well, look, this one's getting kind of beat up. So we ordered, we ordered it. He, he wrote up a card for a new one. I mean, I've had this one for five or six years. So uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah, I've got another one coming, but it's the same one we think as, as the one I'm writing now. Man, it. You are a fascinating human being. I don't know. About I can't. I can't plumb the depths. I have so many questions, and I don't know which to go with first. I think what um, what you're suggesting about the wave pool rentals is those are all good. They have good surfboards available, so it's not like you just show up and you'll ride anything. It's you vetted them, and you know that you can among their quiver, you can find something that fits your your needs and is good quality yeah and you know so i was i was perusing stab today and one of their articles is about this new travel company that they've partnered with called thermal travel have you seen this i saw the article i didn't click on it yeah i haven't read it i clicked on it and then i got pulled away but what i'm getting and i need to look into it but what i sense is that they're all offering 
travel with surfboards on site so you don't have to go lugging boards through yeah through the now i don't know i like i said i have not i have not done any research on this but it that's the kind like, of thing that in that in that entices me you know like that's in, that's interesting to me you know um, yeah i yeah it um a waco hit let's say five years ago and i don't feel like i've seen anything from them in the last year or two maybe because yeah. of covid actually but there was a there was a good year or two when they launched that i would see their stands of boards um while traveling, but also locally, you know, going into local surf shops from San Diego to Santa Cruz, they'd have a rack of boards. And I thought that concept was really good. I just don't know um, if it all just pencils out, you know, it's a, it's a lot of yeah. inventory to stay current with. And then if somebody dings a board or damages a board to replace that. And... It, it seems like a better model. And I don't know, I haven't, I haven't combed through the, the spreadsheet on this, but it does seem like a good model would be, you know, where are you going? Okay, at that place, they have 20 boards that are available to you that you can rent, you know, like, so if you're going to say, um, Kandui Island, right, one of the two resorts on Kandui, each of those resorts has got their quiver of boards that are available to you. Now, that's a spot that's going to break a lot of boards, probably. So maybe yeah. that's not the best. But like, say, for instance, El Salvador or Co or certain places in Costa Rica, um, you know, I could easily see grabbing a, you know, a, a killer Pizel right off of the, the rental rack and, and being psyched. I think with businesses, I, yeah, the concept I agree with completely, but I think for the business to actually operate, businesses like this um, need a lot of capital outlay for until they hit a certain number of subscribers. And so with, Things like Uber, the way that they gain market share is by pricing their rides cheaper than regular taxis, obviously making them more convenient as well. So if they could price the rides cheaper, pay the drivers, they'd be, they're actually losing money on most. I think they were losing like a dollar and seven cents average per ride for the first however many years it was. And they just keep taking on investment and growing the business just to gain market share. And I feel like with that board business, I don't know that anybody would fork out the capital to really do that. Either the boards are gonna be super expensive to rent, to pay for all of the excess inventory that they need um, until they can get the right number of memberships, or they have to kind of break even and do it for free for five or 10 years or something like that. Um, and then of course the memberships come through marketing. So you gotta be spending a ton of money on marketing throughout all of that. Yeah, I think you're looking at it maybe in the wrong way. The way I see it is as if you're, let's say you're Pizel and Pizel surfboards has a marketing budget. And in that marketing budget is a number to provide boards for various locations. So let's say it's um, a surf resort in Costa Rica that everyone already knows about that makes sense to put your boards there. So you put board like you put boards there at cost. Let's say you put forty surfboards there at cost. Maybe that's too many. Maybe twenty. Because what I'm getting at is you would pick the resorts that you know only house eight to ten surfers at a time. You've only got eight to ten surfers at a time that you need to service as the surf resort, right? So you only need fifteen boards because a lot of surfers like you are going to bring your own boards anyway. There's only a few guys like me that are like, screw it, I don't want to travel through the airport. So each resort, you, you pinpoint the good ones that make sense, and you provide them with 15 boards. Now, a cost on 15 boards, let's say it's $400 a board. Um, you know, look at it like, how many boards are you giving to team riders? And if this is purely a marketing effort, if you look at it like, yeah, you can go here and get your Pizel board for two weeks or for a week, whatever it is, you're getting a ton of mojo from the guys that are riding the Pizels. I like that board. I'm going to go home and buy one. So you can, you can offset it. You know what I mean? It's a marketing board, cost. Like you don't look at it like you're trying to make your money back. You look at it like, you know, I can do this as a part of my marketing as well as Instagram and blah, blah, blah. The board builder can, they can justify the marketing. That's, that's what By I'm saying. Way, yeah. But I'm saying a Waco as oh, right. the business. No, no, no. Yeah. That's yeah. Because saying. they can't live on eight memberships, you no. know what I mean? Per resort. Yeah. Per resort times, but they're looking at getting, you know, 
the all the surfers in the world to stop traveling with boards and i think that's just a difficult thing i think they um, have a good idea i just i think they're they're w too early it's I, way too I much capital so. outlay yeah but at any rate you, when you said you don't like traveling with boards my thought is okay i understand you don't want to log log a, co a coffin around that's right. a hassle but you are traveling with one board Right. And the difference from one to two is not that significant. They make those tight, ultra thin bags that are well padded that actually probably are a bit safer than a single board bag uh, because of the padding. Yeah. Look, I was going for three days too. You know, like it was a three day surf trip. So yeah. I'm just going to bring one board. I know what the waves are like. I'm not going gotcha. to. Yeah. If maybe gotcha. if I was going for two weeks to Indo, I would bring two boards. You know, and, and, and of course, many of these spots, you have to worry about broken boards, you know, but I would I would ask all of you listeners out there and you, David, this. If you traveled for the rest of your life with no boards. Do you think that you'd be able to find a board at the location that you go to and Depends. Eat, and rent Depends it how remote or the buy one? I, I, I suggest to you that you could pull it off. That you could just that would be part of the adventure. I'm going with yeah. no boards. You can go to Indo and buy a. Uh, you used to be able to buy a surf tech in Padang, in Padang, yeah. in Sumatra. There was like a well, surf shop there that had boards. I, for the way that I travel at this point in my life, absolutely, I could find boards wherever I go. I'm not roughing it, you know. Yeah, I'm not going camping in the in a jungle somewhere. Um, yeah. So good, that's awesome. And uh, how good did it feel just to focus on solely surfing for the first time in a couple of years? It, just it going was on a trip. Yeah, it was awesome. It was so great. Yeah. I mean, it, three days of, of a point by ourselves. It was ridiculous. Like there was many, many times when I was walking back up the point and there was nobody out. I was walking up watching just empty waves go by and 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 they were fun, like, you know, old guy waves, you know, like like four to five to six feet, you know, yeah. um, just roping through the kind of, you know, for this for this 56 year old body, I was stoked, man. I was Good. getting my mojo on, getting little head dips, chandeliers, little tubes, big hacks, carves, you know, inside bowl, blah, blah, blah. It was fun. Awesome. Super fun. Yeah. Congrats. Good job. Hey, thank you. Um, and did you watch any of the rot nest contests while you were gone? I did. I watched some of the rot nest contest and yeah, go ahead. What are your thoughts on rot nest? it's slow uh it's challenging you know the wave we had no idea what the wave was going to look like when they put this on the schedule and we started to see glimpses of it in the last couple of months um it's tough it's i think if there was enough swell it would totally be a ct quality venue and contestable but there was a lot of heats where one or two of the surfers did not get two set waves to like, it, it was, they were kind of crueled by mother nature and it wasn't a matter of who was the best surfer in the water. So that's always tough when that happens. Um, but that being said, the cream tended to rise to the top thus far in the event, you know, you watch Gabriel paddle out there and he just does what he does what he does. He imposes his will, not only on the competitors, but also on the wave. You know, he'd get a mediocre kind of, uh, the left tends to be fast down the line, but it has kind of a slopey face on it. So it's almost impossible to make it down the line and do turns at the same time. You either just kind of race and never do a turn or try to bang one or two quick ones. Everybody else was struggling with it. Gabe paddles out alley-oop cut back floater you know and it's just he's got so many more tools than anybody else that um that tends to be true whether he's surfing chopu pipe or this brand new venue that nobody's surfed before yeah i think his his heat total was like 15 or something and the other two guys in that round one heat were their, their heat totals were like six or eight yeah. or something it was like night and day when you looked at the yeah so gabe's you know, Gabe's Gabe, right? I mean, he's he's Roger Federer, he's he's Djokovic, he's Nadal, he's he's at the top with those other three or four guys. And um yeah, I mean it wasn't it didn't feel super controlled. <laughs> Jordy surfed well, I thought. 
Um, but he did surf well. Jordy, again, 14-point heat total, which was yeah. high for the day. And I saw a heat with, I don't know, who was it? Two backside surfers that actually absolutely banged the left. It might have been regular, Griffin. Reg, regular footers. Yeah, yeah excuse yeah. me, regular footers. It might have been Griffin and Jack Freestone or something, but. Yep. Griffin looked amazing. Griffin's heat one was pathetic. He got like a five point total round yeah. one. I'm sorry. Seating round heat. And then the elimination round, he really put it together. Yeah. He had a left that he had two big back to back bangs. And I think Taj Which, was in that heat, right? Taj and Jack Freestone. You're right. Yeah. Um, and Griffin is worth discussing because he really started to come together in Margaret's and we commented on it. And I had moments in Margaret where I thought he could win the event and he didn't. I think he narrowly lost to Jordy in the semis, might've been the quarters. And so to see him kind of come back in this event with a similar type of form makes me think Griffin could actually win a world title this year. Those, those fourth and fifth spots are open. Yeah. He could, he could get into the fourth or fifth spot and the final day is at lowers He's a lock at lowers yeah. and sure. So are Gabriel and Idolo and Felipe and the other people that are going to be in the finals. But I mean, honestly, let's say Gabriel, Gabriel's in first position. He's only going to surf one heat that day. You can have one shocker heat and Griffin. I would has more experience at lowers than any of those guys. I guess Felipe lives in San Clemente now, so he's surfed it a bunch, but, but still an argument could be made that Griffin could actually win a world title this year. I think it's more than an argument. I think it's a legitimate thing and I would love to see it. I ask you this question and, and the listeners as well, as far as the WSL is concerned, as far as marketing the WSL, as far as the WSL going, wow, not only a successful season, what a new champion we have, who would that guy be? You know, and in my mind at the end of this year, if you go, wow, Griffin Colapino is our new world champion. That's like the best storyline for the WSL besides perhaps Kelly Slater. Like maybe Kelly's like can still stamp, you know, and I'm just, I'm not saying what could happen. I'm saying like in a, in a dream scenario for the WSL, you know, like Gabe, okay, that's cool. He, everyone knows he's, you know, that wouldn't be like this big coming out party for the marketing department at WSL to be able to go, look at this new great. I just think Griffin would be the best story for the WSL and answer me this. Am I right? And are there a couple of other great stories that would be as good as Griffin Colapendo as the new world champ? Yeah, I don't think it's that great of a story because it calls into question the format. If some young kid can come from kind of the lower ranks and blow, you know, and, and win a world title, but it wasn't at sunset, it didn't have these icon venues on tour this year that we've had all throughout, it calls into question their format for this given year. Well, I'm not asking you to, I'm, I'm asking you to put yourself in the position of the WSL. If you're, if you're, if you're the PR department, what's the best story that you could make? And I think the best story is a young on form. It's not like he was given the thing. He, he would have earned it, you know? Yeah, totally. And, and we're all expecting him to do that, by the way. It's not like, you know, um, Peterson Crisanto won the world title. It's like Griffin's on a, march to do this you know like didn't he win the triple crown or i mean he's proven himself in hawaii he's a freaking great surfer in big waves at so i'm gonna so, i'm gonna i'm gonna retract everything that i just said yeah <laughs> and i'm gonna say maybe this isn't an indictment of the format maybe it's an improvement on the format because in the past when you get somebody chloe andino his predecessor i mean honestly they're cut from the same cloth right and why does it take Kaloe 10 years to figure out how to win a world title? Generally, it takes people that long to figure out a world title, except for Kelly Slater and Gabriel Medina, maybe. Like most people, it takes years and years and years. And I don't know that that's actually a good thing. I think there's that difficult of a learning curve on this specific tour. But if there is a, a world kind of... Um, I don't know, world-class talent that everybody sees coming up the ranks that we can all point to everybody, including often Kelly Slater can point to and just go, this is the best surfer in the world. Dane Reynolds, this is the best surfer in the world. And then the best surfer in the world goes on this tour and can't put together a heat win. It's kind of like, 
well, man, there must be too much friction in the system to not allow the best surfers in the world to actually win yeah. world titles. No, I think, well, there's a difference between the best free surfer in the world and the best surf, the best competitive surfer. And that's why I think pro surfing is very, very important because they're all great surfers. And we always point this out on the show, but it's like, who's actually got the moxie, the like the street cred, like the ability psychologically to handle it all. And, and the thing with Griffin is it seems like it's a perfect storm. Like you think about um, even Kanoa or Kolohe and you're like, why haven't they? You know, and we don't really know the answer. We can guess that, you know, there's obviously, it's not their surfing ability. It's obviously outside issues that are causing them to not pull it off, whatever they may be. And Griffin seems to be in this kind of, and maybe it's because he has brothers and he's got, he's always had, it's, it doesn't seem to affect him as much. He seems on top of his game. He looked insane at Margaret's. We, we, you know, he did. We talked about it the other day. And I just, I don't know why, but I just feel like, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I would not be surprised if Griffin Colpino was our world champion. But back to my original question, is there anybody else, if you're in the PR department, that would be a better story for the WSL than Griffin Colapinto? I don't know. I can't think of one. Would it, would you know, well, what about Kanoa? Is Kanoa, because it's the Olympic year and all of that, would Kanoa be like the great <clears throat> story? You know, like, I don't, I don't feel like Kanoa's is a better story. I think maybe they would get more um, marketing. Yeah, maybe they'd get more marketing leverage out of Kanoa. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. I, I mean, I'm trying to go through the list of like an, a story of Julian Wilson or Jordy finally achieving theirs. Jordy, yeah. You or, you or I would be happy about, but I don't know that that's a better story from a marketing standpoint. What what could get more cash eh, from the marketing department? Um, well, think about those two, right? Julian and Jordy. To me, those seem like, those seem like everyone's like, oh, everyone like exhales and go, okay, finally. Like that story is kind of like, finally he got it done. You yeah, know, exactly. and to me, that's not as sexy as a story as, oh my God, we've got this rising new star that's just blue doors and won the thing from, stole it from Gabe and stole it from Idolo and stole it from John, John, well, John, you know, stole it from the top three guys, you yeah. know, and that's a much sexier story from a PR thing. Because now what we've got is we've got a new rivalry perhaps starting to brew. Jordy or Julian's kind of like when Aki won or Sonny, you're like, yeah oh great you know well deserved what a good it is a good story for sure it's a great story but it's not like the you know like the cool there's another guy to add to the mix you know yeah yeah, yeah. um back to you were saying that's why competitive surfing is important it's because you want to see who can handle all of those pressures and all that sort of stuff yeah i mean anyone can there's a lot of guys who can surf the ball 125 miles per hour but who can do it in a five sets on TV and national TV in front of New Yorkers? Yeah. You know, there's only four guys that can do it. Right. One guy. Yeah. So it, it's about the mental game. And that's why, you know, like people are like, Oh, best surfer in the world is Dane Reynolds. You know, I'm like, yeah, he rips. And you know, he's probably, maybe he's that was the best free surfer. You know, maybe it's Craig Anderson, but what, you know, my thing is like, you got to have balls to go on tour and win, win a world title. It's not for everyone. But it takes a special person to, to be able to get underneath the pressure. It's about the pressure. That's what the competition's about. Well, this could be Griffin's year because <clears throat> for the reasons we just stated, but also the venues coming up, Surf Ranch, he surfs very well at Surf Ranch. It's very well suited for him. Um, Selena, is Selena Cruz still on the schedule? I, I think La Bamba or um, Barra is on the schedule. Yeah. Barra. Um, I think they shifted it because it conflicted with the ISA games. Like it overlapped with those ISA dates that Fernando wanted everybody, the team to go down there. Yeah. Um, so let's presume that happens. That suits his, I mean, Absolutely. that suits him almost better than anybody else. And if his main contenders are goofy footers, Idolo and Gabriel, that is a notoriously challenging venue for goofy footers. Yeah. And then Brazil, I think, is still officially on the vent on the schedule, but we'd be shocked if that actually runs. Um, Chopu would be a challenge for Griff. I don't know. I, don't, I haven't seen a ton of him out there. That would favor the goofy footers. 
But again, all we got to do is get him in that top five and then it lowers. He can just run the court. Yeah. I'm looking online right now to try to figure out the schedule. Yeah. And they don't do a very good job. I got, you think I should be able to just go find the WCT. Let me see. Maybe I'm doing it. Yeah, okay. Here we go. It's challenging. Um, so May. we've got Surf Ranch in June. We've got Mexico in July. We've got okay, yeah. uh, Rio and Tahiti in August. And then the final stay at Lowers. So yeah, I got them the right, right the first time. Okay, so look, R- Rio's not gonna happen. Right. Right, come on. Anyway, I agree to you. Uh, this does set up well for Griff. I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of like all in on Griff right now. Okay. Like I would be stoked if he won the world title. I just think it would be a, everything about it is good. He's currently positioned sixth, and ahead of him is John John, who obviously is injured, so John will get bumped out. And uh, so yeah, then it would just be Jordy, Felipe, Idolo, Gabe, and Griff's in the fifth spot currently. That would On, be sweet. And again, and again, kind of improving his results. So yeah, that's hey, interesting. What? I'm gonna go fill up my coffee. I'm gonna be right okay. back. Okay. Okay. Get cool. some coffee. You look at me, so, you give me this look like, I don't know what. Just happy to see you. <laughs> it's not the look I saw. Uh, let's hit a quick mid-roll for neatessentials.com. Yeah, neatessentials, neatessentials.com. I'm a big fan of their board shorts, of their wetsuits. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a big fan of that uh, wet dry bag. So neat totally. essentials. Yeah. My, my go-to product for everybody, throw it in the bag as an add-on when you're checking out with your wetsuit or whatever is the walk shorts made out of the board short material, but with pockets, I wear the walk shorts actually. Here they are. I wear these every single day in and around the house, out and about to go get coffee, whatever. And um, they're just lightweight. They're lightweight, easy, dry really easily as well. So I'm a big fan of meat essential. What are you laughing at? <laughs> You're officially old. You've got your old man outfit. Remember a couple of years ago, I had my old man outfit. I'm like, I could just your wear uniform. this. Uniform. Yeah, my uniform. Those you know, pants. Like, the, like the jumpsuit, <laughs> you know, like the blue exactly. jumpsuit the old guy used to wear in the garage while he was working on his wood shop stuff. Exactly. Yeah. That's me and me. I'm fine with this. That's the whole premise of Neat Essentials, by the way, is it's everything you need, nothing you don't. It's simple. You just have your dry bag, your board shorts, your Robin, Robin, what's his name? Should make one of those little single piece zip. Yeah, the one piece jumper zips, you know. (laughs) The onesie. Um, Well, thanks to Neat Essentials. They've been with us for years. We're huge fans. Um, Lost Lost Track Atlantic episode two is coming soon, I think, within the next week or two. So you can look forward to that as well. Killer. And then, of, and then of course, athleticgreens.com slash surf. Stay healthy. I do this every single day, just daily. Drink it. It takes 30 seconds to mix and to drink in total. And um, all of my nutrition is covered for the day. And you can set up a monthly subscription. That's kind of the way to do it, which by the way, Scott, more powder is coming to you. Yeah, good. I need more. I was out or I'm running out. And so I figured you were running out too. Yep, so yep. I asked them to ship it on Monday. Cool. Um, yeah. So set up the monthly description on Nitas or on uh, athleticgreens.com slash serve. And then you just never have to worry about nutrition. Just every morning, drink it. Forget about it. Athleticgreens.com slash serve. Go do it. Scott, welcome back from your coffee break. Um, yeah. I was thinking about it though. Yeah. When you ditched out to Mexico last week, did you leave your aunt high and dry for her doctor's appointment? When we signed off last week, you said you had to take your aunt to a doctor's appointment. On what day? I took her Wednesday. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. I took her, gotcha, I took gotcha. her Wednesday. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Covered all your bases. Well I done. Took, I took her. Yeah. What a good nephew. Um, so Griffin Colapinto is our pick officially. <laughs> Um, yeah, he really then, is. What do you give me an update on the Olympics? Some breaking news yeah. yesterday. Yeah, I sent you that thing. So I mean, it, it's not official, but there's uh, an entire you know consortium of doctors in Japan, Japanese doctors that have signed on to this thing. They're saying 
please cancel the Olympics. We don't want the Olympics here. Our hospitals are filled to capacity. This thing's just going to get worse here. They don't have, I think, 5% of their population is vaccinated, 95% not vaccinated. And all these people coming in, even though there's not spectators, all these athletes and everybody coming in from all over the world with no beds available because their hospitals are already right there. And uh, somebody else, I, I read another article and I'll try to summarize it, but it was basically like the tone of it was, hey, nobody loves the Olympics more than the Japanese and the Japanese culture. Their heroes are, are Olympic stars. Their politicians are former Olympic stars. Their Olympic stars are in the media like nowhere else. They're a big part of their pop culture. They're heroes. They're way bigger than even Michael Phelps is here. Like their, their stardom transcends forever. So they, that's a nation state that has fully embraced the concept of the Olympic star and Olympians and the Olympics. And they're the last country to go cancel it. But when they're saying, when, and I think it's something like 75% of the population of Japan is saying, you know what, cancel this thing. Um, that's saying something. That's not just like some political movement going, you know. So anyway, I don't know what's going to happen with it, but there's some rumblings that, you know, movers and shakers, the Japanese health, you know, the doctors um, and the population is kind of like, you know what, it doesn't look good for us. And so yeah. anyway, let's more is to be revealed. I'm not, you know, I don't want the Olympics canceled, but I'm just telling you what it was in the mainstream media yesterday. Despite their, um, <clears throat> you know, fanfare for the Olympics and everything you just said, they're also a culture, I think, that values science. And so I could see the government um, agreeing with what their own scientific community actually is suggesting. Yeah, what a concept, science. <laughs> <laughs> um, so interestingly, John John Florence, we kind of touched on this last week, but the three, the two American um, surfers in the Olympics, there's two main surfers and then there's a few alternates. The two main surfers, Kaloe and Dino, number one, is out with injury. He might be back uh, in contestable shape for the Olympics. We don't know yet. And then John John Florence just went down as well at Margaret River. And again, we don't know what his recovery looks like. But it doesn't, to be honest, I don't think it looks great. Um, we don't know. He hasn't said what kind of a tear it in is it is in his knee. And he did have surgery on it um late last week i think thursday wednesday thursday of last week so he's in recovery in southern california right now but will he be the other thing is will he be back in fighting shape like even if he's back surfing within two months will he be at a world contender level to compete against felipe toledo in the beach breaks of uh you know I don't think Felipe, Felipe's not on the Brazilian team. Oh, he's not. Okay. No. You're right. You're right. Idolo and Idolo and uh, Gabe. But uh, it's, it's a couple of things. First off is the, when the injury occurred, he did not come in. He continued to serve. So that tells me that it's one of these smaller tears that is painful and is problematic and that you notice when you're doing things, but it does allow you to function. He continued to ride throughout that heat, right? Um, two, the spin, I don't know if it's spin, it's probably the truth that Dr. Kramer and John John put out on John John's Instagram is that it was a successful surgery. Everything's on track to be ready for the Olympics. I sense that if he wasn't, that they would say so, that they would do the right thing and go, you know what, there's no way I can do the Olympics. I'm, I have to remove me from the equation and let's move the next guy up so he can gear up for the United States of America. So I sense that he will be available for the Olympics and, and will he be in fighting shape? That's actually a valid question. Not that the others aren't valid questions, but I, that's probably the most important one. Will he be, you know, cardio, will his cardio be there? Um, look, it's not like it's, you know, eight foot France. It's going to be two foot Shitashita beach in Japan. Which um, is even, to be honest, that's worse for his knee. Like, I feel like John can I'm talking about his cardio though. I'm talking about his cardio. Yeah, 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 yeah. In terms of cardio, you're right. But uh, I disagree. They wouldn't, if they if it was a bad enough injury to where he knew it was going to be six months, then yes, he would just come out and say it. 
But this is an injury where he feels it was just like last time he did it when he was looking at pipeline, like, oh, maybe I'll be able to get through a few heats kind of a thing. Like I, I'll be back surfing around that time. I'm not sure how good I'll be surfing. So I'm going to play it day by day. I think that's what's happening here. But interestingly, again, this could be the year of Griffin. It's like Griffin could backdoor his way through this format change into a world title and also the Olympics because he is that third spot. And the other really cool thing- oh, I'm sorry, fourth, fourth spot after Kevin. Right, fourth. The, you know, we're kind of putting a spotlight on Griffin today and I'm glad we are, but he also has been under the radar, which is kind of beneficial to him. Like no yeah. one's been like going, oh, Griffin world title no, or Griffin Olympics. He's just been slowly surfing like a, a monster in these events. Yeah. And um, it just doesn't surprise me. So that's kind of interesting. Like for the first time ever, I guess today we're sort of having our Griffin coming out party. And, um, you know, I'm not sure how much pressure you and I can put on him. I don't think it matters. No. Um, I think he, so anyway, he has been under the radar, which helps, right? Uh, John, John. The, you know, the other thing that's of interest here, right, is that stabs rich list. And the one thing that we all know about the Olympics is that the Olympics are super important to these athletes and their sponsors and their value to the sponsors. And that's a big deal. I mean, um, I'm not sure, um, you know, how much more money John John makes for being in the Olympics, but I know his sponsors want him there. And um, that, that's something that needs to be considered as well. Olympics aside, who would get the wild card, the injury wild card for the 2022 WSL CT season if Chloe and Dino is vying for it, Kelly Slater is vying for it, John John Florence is vying for it. That makes a very, very tough call. How many spots are available? One. Uh, I think there, it's, Isn't there one injury wild card? I don't know. I think there is, yeah. If there's only one... It's very, very interesting, right? Because you would think Kelly would raise his hand and go, hey, I'd like my swan song, you know, to be 2022, a full season at G-Land and all these great spots. This will be my last year. Give it to me and you'll have a storyline throughout the whole year at each and every spot. You can just do all sorts of content around all my history at these spots, you know, blah, 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 right? But John John's the obvious one. John John's He's far and away. Yeah. yeah, he's yeah. He's a title he's like, contender in his prime. Yeah. So maybe there's two. Now that I'm thinking about it, there might be two. I know this year um, there was a surf off between Mikey Wright and Leonardo Fioravanti for the one remaining spot, but maybe John John got the initial one, right? Would that make sense? John John got a wild, an injury wild card, and then so there was one left over. Oh, so right. maybe there's two total. Yeah. So that would mean John John would be the shoe in, and yeah. then it would come down to Kelly ver Kelly versus Kaloe. <laughs> well, I mean, like I said, I, I think that story has already written itself. I mean, this is this has got to be Kelly, right? I'm not saying so, Kelly deserves it over Kaloe. I mean, if you purely go off of results, it's Kaloe, right? Could you imagine Kaloe getting bumped? I mean, this is what happened to Rob Machado, right? Exactly. I mean, exactly Rob Machado. Right. What, what place was he in when he was injured? Like second? He, yeah, he was, yeah, he was right there. I mean, that was, that's probably one of the greatest undocumented, unvetted, unexcavated story. Uh, one of them that could be, that would make a great documentary because I know that, that that pissed off Rob Machado. Of course. And you know yeah, who did so, that, right? You know who did that? Who? Rabbit. Bartholomew. Oof. Oof. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm sure that there was other players in it, but he was the president of the ASP at the time. If I'm not mistaken, I don't want to step on Rabbit's toes here and be wrong here, but the way I've heard it from Rob is that, you know, it was Rabbit's decision and Rabbit went with, I, here's the other thing. Who did he, who took his place? I forget. It was, you know, it was somebody like Luke Monroe or something. You know, it's like, I don't know. But that's my point is that it would be a great story. Like if there's a young storyteller out there that wants to, this would make a great podcast. I think. So, so Rob um, was also at a transitional time in his life, I feel, where he was kind of like, you know what? I'd be happy just kind of um, drifting. No? No. I mean, he might spin it that way, but 
for some reason, I specifically remember Rob telling me or hearing Rob talk about um, the disappointment yeah. that they no, he was they, definitely that, disappointed. that they didn't pick him. Yeah, and um, and I mean, look, a couple of years later, he came back to win the Pipe Masters as a wild card. Yeah, but he was he was definitely in his prime. I want to say he was second when he got injured. Exactly, and then they, and then they didn't give him his the wild card replacement, and he simply elected to not do the QS and try to get back on tour and all that sort of stuff. And that's what the movie, the second coming of drifting was about, by the way, was him like refinding his purpose in Bali um, after he had been off tour and that was his whole identity. But that would be a total shocker to see something similar happen to Chloe Andino where even though he's not winning a world title, he's always been in the conversation. I feel like the last full season on tour, he was in the mathematically in the running going into pipeline. And so to see him end up back on the QS, trying to get back on tour would be a real nightmare for him. I don't think he would do that. Which, would, which would be what Rob chose to do or not right. to do. Right. Crazy. I, think, I know that that would be a gnarly story, man. But how do you not give it to Kelly? You have to give it to Kelly, I think. I mean, you you kind of owe it to Kelly. Oh, by the way, doesn't Kelly own part of the WSL? Like, <laughs> no. He doesn't? I don't know. Yeah, no one knows. Uh, so the only caveat here is that John John could re-qualify by virtue of his um, points that he's accumulated thus far. You know, yeah. like if he ends up in the top 20 by the end of the season, then he won't be vying for the wild card. He will just, I mean, maybe he still could actually just to maintain like a better uh, position going into the next season, but he wouldn't need to. He could just go into the next season ranked low. And um, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, if he surfs in the Olympics, then that says, well, he's ready to surf in other competitions and there will be like two or three or maybe just one more competition after the Olympics, whatever happens in August would be, I guess, the final event. Yeah. Let's see if I can pull that up. Um, I've got feedback for you, Scott, from a listener, if you'd like to hear it. Yeah, let's, let's hear it. I'm sure there are some angry people. <laughs> no, not at all. There's been so much warm-hearted support of your rant that you did. Not a rant, what should I, your impassioned celebration of Michael Ho. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. People, I, people love it. Yes. Because number number one, it is a feel-good story, but number two, you're just so right. Like he's 64 years old. I forget exactly. I think 64. Yeah. 64 years old. And what he's doing, I mean, I know 60-year-old people that have a hard time walking. Exactly. And it's I'm, not yeah. because they've sustained any sort of injury. It's just they have not been um, proactive with their health. And so to see Michael Ho doing what he's doing is unreal. This listener, Dave A said, Hey, Scott, I lived on the North shore from 74 to 80. I thought Michael was one of the most underrated surfers of the seventies. One time he surfed Honolulu Bay for a week. Then we flew back on the same plane and he gave me and my buddy a ride back to the North shore. Uh, we both lived on the beach at sunset which was truly unruly and closed out that day. Mike dropped us off. We sat on our porch to watch the sunset. And then Michael paddled out with no one else out and surfed the unruly surf until dark. P.S. Your perseverance and equanimity with the boardroom show in spite of its challenges is amazing. Oh, well, that's very nice. Thank you, Dave. Dave's a long time listener. And yeah, look, the cool thing about Michael, Hall, I watched it. Somebody posted something on Instagram about it. And, and I chimed in. How about if you watch the end of that wave, he doggy doors with his hands behind his back. Who doggy doors out with his hands behind his back, like super soul style? Like that was insane. That was now, I mean, if you ever wonder where Mason gets it, that was uber groovy. Like, have you ever, ever, ever seen anyone doggy door with their hands behind their back at backdoor pipe? No, you're always like trying to, you know, lead the way, you know, let the hands lead the way out of there. Yeah. It's incredible. It really is incredible. By the way, check this out. Florence Marine X. Where'd you get that, Scott? 
I bought it. I went onto their website and bought my Florence Marine X. I'm supporting, man. No way. Look at you, bros. I got it too. <laughs> That's cool. I'm a member. I signed up for the membership and did the whole deal. And I just wanted to support, you know. Yeah. I like those guys. I'm a big fan of the Hurleys and John John and the whole camp is just one of, you know salty. One of their one of their key uh team members uses athletic greens now because of us, by the way. Oh good. Yeah, and he just messaged me and he was like, dude, I'm loving athletic green. Because he told me he signed up and then he messaged me yesterday, I think, or the day before, going, Hey, I love the product. So but I, I agree too. with you. The Florence yeah. Florence Marine X, um, I got t-shirts um the t-shirts are great and the hooded did you get one of the hooded ones no i just bought this one thing this long the long chief. is it a long sleeve yeah long sleeve tee yeah so it might be the same as the hooded just the hood as a hood the hooded has a hood yeah. um but yeah i wore that yesterday it's great great quality love it john john's wearing them in his recovery as well i've seen so. <laughs> yeah okay. anything that john john does I'm cool with it. I am too. Um, so Scott, my must-see moment. This thing is mind-blowing. There's There's been a number of great clips out this week. Mason Ho dropped a clip. Um, Dion Aegeus dropped his clip with Joe G, which is always kind of cinematic and amazing. But there's just one clip that stands head and shoulders above the rest. And it is 11-year-old yeah. Cruz Denofa doing a backside front flip in Waco. Right. I mean, have you seen it? I think I have seen it. Maybe I haven't. Maybe it would have stuck out in my head a little bit more. You have not you have not seen it. Okay. It was right it was right when you left. I feel like it was on your travel day last week. Okay. I'll send it to you. Yeah. 11 11 year old Cruz Denofa. He's been doing a couple of air like He's been doing cool airs in wave pools for, I don't know, um, a year now we've seen him. And so he's been on my radar, but this thing is gnarlier than anything that we've ever seen anybody do, period. It's the gnarliest air that we've seen. He's backside on a left, goes into a, like what would be, I don't know, an El Rolo type spin, double grab and does a full flip, front okay. flip, backside. Hold on, I'm just texting it to you. So here he goes. He's flying. Gnarly. Wow, the slow mo is insane. Yeah, this is mind blowing. I mean, this is just like, this just speaks to the power of, of wave pools. It it's does. Like, you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. This is, this stuff's, this in a year, this is going to be old hat. <laughs> you know, there's going to be two of them. Somebody's going to do two of them. Well, it's it's so futuristic that it's actually hard to wrap your mind around. You watch it and you go, whoa. It's like when Zoltan was doing his kickflips. Like you see it and you think, <laughs> that's amazing. But my brain doesn't quite relate it to what I do on a surfboard. So I just, I'm going to look away and, you know, like it's that crazy. It's yeah, otherworldly. It's, it's, it's a young man's sport at that point. That's just mind blowing. He's 11, he's 11 years old. Yeah, it's just like these young kids in skate parks that are it, like, there's like these whole slew of girls that are just insane and they're all like featherweights. I know. And the thing that blows my mind about his, this kid surfing too is his board control. Like his, maybe it is from skating now that you say that, like the control of the rotation and all of it is really impressive. Yeah, it's mind blowing. Isn't it? It's, it's mind blowing. It's it's next level. And it's also so out of reach for for me, obviously, but and I want to say maybe for I mean, I I'm just wondering is it it's certainly not gimmicky, but um I mean it's mind blowing, but it's so far away from the average surfer what the average surfer is trying to do that um, I mean, this kid should be in the Olympics. <laughs> you know what I mean? This kid should be in the Olympics. This is Olympic game stuff. If that happened during the Olympics, this kid would be a multimillionaire. It's certainly X game stuff. Same thing. 
Well, I mean, in terms of like, there might be a format at the Olympics where that wouldn't actually score a score that well, or it'll be one no. giant score. And then he doesn't do a couple of turns to back it up, you know, but the X game, if it was an X game format where the biggest trick wins, then. I guarantee you that the, the, the higher ups at the highest level of the Olympic games are jealous of the X games. And they're trying to bring that vibe to the Olympics. Yeah. And they, that's why surfing's in the Olympics. Yeah. Well, must see moment, Cruz Genova's backside front flip. Excuse yeah. me. Um, well, I've got some other stuff. I didn't know you were going to, we got to leave so quick, but um, it's okay. Hit him. You know what? There was a shark attack yesterday in Australia. A surfer was attacked by a 15 foot, 15 feet long shark. They believe it to be a great white shark. And the surfer died of his injuries. This happened on New South Wales Central Coast, Forrester Beach. Um, he was in his 50s. He suffered critical injuries to his upper thigh. So that tells me that the shark came up, bit him, spit him out, and he bled out. And that's what happened. He had cardiac arrest due to, due to uh, blood loss. It's the eighth fatal shark attack, two of which were in New South Wales in the year 2020. And um, there was another article I read. I don't know if I sent it to you. That kind of went more into the... Um, uh, into the weeds on statistics regarding shark attacks in Australia. And there's no doubt that there are a heck of a lot more shark attacks um, and deaths in recent times. Now, I don't know what you attribute to that to. Um, maybe they're more getting reported. Maybe there's more people in the water. Maybe there's more sharks. Maybe it's all three of those things. But um, eight fatal shark attacks. And oh, by the way, didn't one of the heats, it's rottenness gets get put on hold because of shark spotting. Yeah, Sighting? and yeah. yes, and elsewhere too. I feel like Newcastle or Narrabeen maybe got put on hold, or maybe it was just Margaret, uh, I forget. But yes, they've got spotters. They're looking for that. And if a shark comes within a certain, I don't know, perimeter, they call the contest or they put it on hold until yeah. the shark leaves, which by the way, super... Uh, simple protocol to implement, you know, I mean, and very smart and prudent. I think they've got it really well dialed. The Mick Fanning situation was a real, real dodged bullet in Jeffrey's Bay. Yeah. Like that, that for that to happen that way and Mick to come out unscathed is really a one in a million shot. And so I think that was a good warning. And the WSL, this policy of just spotting and putting it on hold, is just totally practical and it doesn't interrupt the uh, the main purpose which is running the event that much so yeah i think they're doing a great job with that speaking of mcfan did i uh, did you already talk about the stab rich list on your other shows or something because mm -mm. this is on our list of things to discuss today but um i mean mick fanning is number two right i mean that doesn't surprise but it's interesting. it does surprise Kind of did it kind of surprised me a little bit well i think it's a good thing i i mean in terms of i don't think the entire rich list should reflect who's on tour you know but it does well it it has in the past and what i'm suggesting is that surfing is so much more robust than professional competitive surfing and i would love to see people making a living from uh versions of surfing that aren't just wearing a jersey and so certainly Mick has gained all of his celebrity from his competitive prowess. Yeah. But to see him be able to still maintain, you know, um, I don't know, a bit of a spotlight and reverence and a paycheck and all that sort of stuff in his retirement, I think is great. And, and it's also an indicator that he was smart with his investments. You know, I know he's invested in a lot of the things that are reflecting that paycheck. But. Yeah, I don't know. I, but th this rich list isn't based on investments, though. It's just based purely on money made off of sponsorships and I think career winnings or uh, yearly winnings, maybe. Or maybe it's just sponsorships. I think it's just sponsorships. Just what you're actually collecting a paycheck from. Yeah. Because I think he cashed um, in big on his beer, right? They sold his beer company for like 200 million or something. Yeah. So that's, yeah. So his net, this isn't in any way related to net worth. No. Um, so Gabriel's at 2.2, Mick is at 1.8, so not far behind Gabe. So ultimately what that means is that Rip Curl is paying Mick 
a lot of money to be Mick. And they're fine with it, according to the article, according to Neil Ridgway and the work that Sam did talking to Neil. They're, yeah. Neil Ridgway is, he's a smart cookie, man. I'm a fan of his. Even though um, he can be a bit of, you know, he's a pretty bit headstrong, but he, he's been around the block and he knows what's going on. So Gabriel, also on Rip Curl, um, has so many stickers on his board and is currently at the top of his game. In a lot of metrics, you could say that Gabe should be making triple what Mick is making. And it's surprising to me that he's only 400,000 higher than Mick. Does it have something to do with the currency? I, I wonder if, does Gabe have a USA presence or does he live and does he have to convert to the, re, to the Brazil real? And does that affect his dollar amount? I think it might. I mean, I it, shouldn't, aff I really it shouldn't affect it. It shouldn't affect it that much. I mean, I, like I said, by a lot of metrics, he should be making triple what Mick's making, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so it shouldn't be such a close, if the difference is they were making equal amounts, and you know, and the difference is he gets a crappier exchange, then that would make sense. But yeah, I don't know. Um, anyways, Felipe Toledo's number three, right under Mick, by the way, at 1.75. Kanoa is number four at 1.7. Kaloe's number five at 1.2. Jordy's number six at 1,500,000. No, I'm sorry, one one million fifty thousand. 50,000. Did I see Jordy? Yeah. That was J that was JJF. That was John John Florence, who's just over a million bucks. Right. Jordy is just under a million bucks at 940,000. Idolo is kind of the shocker on the list. Number eight at 900,000. Griffin is number nine at 750,000. Kai Lenny is number 10 at 750. And Julian is number 11 at 600 without a main sponsor. Wow. Well, I, I'm glad that, you know, these guys are making some money. That's a good thing, right? Kai Lenny's the only one other than Mick that isn't on the world tour on this list. Um, and it makes sense. I'm actually surprised that he's under a million bucks. Me to too. Be honest. Me too. Because not only, not only because of his visibility and what he's doing, but a lot of his sponsors, I would think like Red Bull's a big paycheck. Hurley used to be a big paycheck. I don't know if it is anymore. He's got non-endemics like Tag Heuer. Um, so I was surprised to see that. I'm wondering too, uh, some of this seems to be reflective, like Rip Curl pays a lot of money. Griffin and Idolo are on Billabong and they're making a similar salary. So I'm wondering if the sponsors themselves kind of just mandate like, hey, this is what we pay our athletes and we would love to have you on the team. And there's not a lot of negotiation involved after that. Yeah, I think that's the case right now. The, the leverage, all the, the brands have all the leverage and um, they got a wide, you know, labor pool to select from. And yeah, and I think the, the athletes are like, I'll take what I can get. And I'm just glad I signed a contract. You know what I mean? It's interesting though, because I remember in COVID, everybody's contracts were getting cut. And I feel like Griff was one of those examples. Don't quote me here, but I feel like his contract was for 600 and they renegotiated it down to 300. And coming out of this, can they renegotiate? You know, because like as the world opens up and surfing's more popular than ever, and he's going to win a world title, and he's going to be in the Olympics and all that sort of stuff. You know, in, in theory, the um, employer can just say, no, you're held, you're beholden to this contract with the bonuses or whatever, but you're beholden to the contract. But Griff has a good argument to be able to well, negotiate I think a lot, up. A lot of them have, uh, incentives regarding the Olympics. So, and those aren't reflected in here because the Olympics haven't occurred. Yeah. And those might be reflected in next year's list if one of these guys goes on to win the Olympics because you win the Olympics, your incentives are pretty big. I mean, you can imagine any company's gonna be like, dude, we'll gladly pay you a million extra dollars if you're the gold medalist. Absolutely, go get them. But this is only good for us, so. I mean, the thing is these surf industry relationships where you sign these long-term contracts, uh, an outside a telephone company can approach Griffin and trump that and not ask for a contract. Just be like, hey, one time commercial, here, you won the Olympics. Here's a commercial. Here's a million bucks. Absolutely. Take it. You know, and he's a like, sweet. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to Disneyland. 
I exactly. use Verizon, you know, whatever it is, you know, there's just going to be one. It's like, and like it doesn't count, count conflict. Them. It no, doesn't conflict with any of his surf brands. And it also um, is a small marketing spend for Verizon at that point, as you know, compared to what we're dealing with in surfing, like for them, it's nothing. And it's a well, huge number yeah, in surfing. Exactly. It totally makes sense for like a, a huge non-endemic like Verizon, for example, right? You're right. Because yeah. boom. I mean, the whole world's going to see, is going to know who this guy Griffin Colapinto is mm -hmm. or whoever the winner is, right? The whole world is like my grandmother, you're, everyone's going to know. Oh, yeah. did you see the surfer Griffin? He's so cute or whatever, you know, like, and so Verizon just goes, boom, let's just blow him up. And then, you know, everyone will forget about him. By the way, I just had a thought, you know, who? so Rob Machado, I think is sponsored by that company, Viore. Did I say that right? Viore? I don't know. V -O -U I've never -O -U -R. Said they're sort of like a crossover yoga surf clothing company here in Encinitas and they're cool. They make really cool stuff. And I'm a fan. That would be a good company to go get a storyteller and develop that story about Rob um, and, and the, you know, that year, but he didn't get the wild card, the injury yeah. wild card. And you finish yeah. it off. You finish the whole thing off with 2000 year, 2000 pipeline masters winner where he got to just kind of like go, Hold you guys. Yeah. It was a shame. It was a shame to not have him on. I mean, he was such a good thing for the tour. I mean, I think I think he made the finals of the US Open like three like two or three years in a row after that, too. Like yeah. it wasn't like he dropped out. He he competed against guys in the world and I, he did really well in the US Open a couple of years. So I'm surprised. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's more to the story with Rabbit. Uh, making the call was it personal was it punitive I, well I don't know but it needs to be evaded. but as I recall um, my my recollection of it is that is that you know rabbit comes from this place where back in the day, he wrote letters to Fred Hemmings and he was tugging on Fred Hemmings shoulder going don't forget about me when you drop the heats I want to be in this contest you know and he would and, and I sense that Rob just kind of, and again, I'm not, I'm just reading into this. I don't have anything to backs this up, but I sense that Rob was like, dude, I'm number two in the world. Of course I'm getting it. Like, and I don't, I, I think that other guys that did get that wild, and I forget who got the wild card that year. I think that guy was an Australian and he was in rabbit's ear going, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. And rabbit made the call and goes, it looks to me like I didn't hear from Rob. So I'm going to give it to you. You know, I didn't get any letters from Rob, you know? So I think that there's some of that, but yeah. again, I I'm making all this up. I know you're not, assuming yeah, as you're it. saying, as you're saying it, I'm more details are coming to me. I do remember this and yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it was exactly what you said, but it was actually more formal than that. There's actually meetings that you have to go to, to exactly. vie for the spot. You have to like go <laughs> show up go show yeah, up they in Australia. Like, yeah. And they have like an actual committee and you listen to everybody's argument and all that sort of stuff. And I think that Rob didn't show up to that. So exactly. the WSL could, or the uh, ASP at the time could make a legal justifiable case and be like, here are the rules. And I could see rabbit also being the one who does just stick to the rules. Hey, we designed these rules for this exact reason. And yes, we love you and we know that you're great, but you need to come play by the rules. And yeah. Rob put his foot down and Rabbit had to put his foot down and the rest is history. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, I, again, I think, it's, I think it's an interesting story. I, and as I think about it, maybe it's not a good story for a company that's sponsoring Rob. It needs to be a, a story that comes out in, in full documentary style with yeah. all of the, all of the truth told, you know, no spin. Yeah. Um, in regards to payments and people's salaries, my Duke of the week is yeah. WSL commentator Stace Galbraith. Do you know why? I don't even know who. <laughs> That's too bad. Well, I'm, gl I'm glad to call him to your attention. He's the guy who's doing all of the post heat interviews and the beach interviews oh, during the WSL okay. broadcast. Yeah. Uh, I think he's doing a phenomenal job. I think he's a great addition to the team, but the reason why he is the Duke is because when Kai Wabelli won his round two heat States said, Hey, you got a new sticker on your board there, don't you? And Gabriel or, and uh, Kyle said, 
Absolutely, I do. I am surfing for the people now. I am very grateful that the people got together to show their support for me, and I'm thrilled to surf for the people. That's so great. I'm so stoked to hear that. That's cool. And and that guy has been doing a great job. I just didn't know his name, but um, he's he's fluid. Uh, he comes off, um, you know, not stiff. He's um, he's great at what he's doing. Well, I mean, he's uh, sharp and he's to the point. He's sharp and he's yeah. to the point, and he's insightful. So. He's in a way that I always felt other commentators um, were towing the company line, you know, and they're just asking kind of questions that won't ever put the WSL's decisions in a compromising, you know, situation. Yeah. I feel like Stace has more got his thumb on the pulse of surf culture and surfing and what's happening behind the scenes. And so he's yeah. asking these really precise, insightful questions that excavate like this exact thing, what's up with yeah. that sticker on your board? And not that that is, he's also doing it in a way that also toes the company line. Like he's not yeah. calling into question anything from the WSL or nothing that he's said or that he's asked of the competitor reflects poorly on the WSL. Uh, but it's much more, it just provides a much clearer and more well-rounded picture of what's going on for each of these yeah. surfers. And one thing was his questioning of Jeremy Flores when they were in Newcastle, I believe, you know, and he kind of gave Jeremy an open-ended question and Jeremy took the ball and ran with it and said, Hey man, the waves suck and I'm here to surf good waves. And this is an unfortunate situation that we're in and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> and so again, the WSL never copped the heat for that. Nobody ever said you guys made a bad decision, but it allowed uh, Jeremy to express his true feelings, you know? Yeah. So I think he's doing a great job and he's also getting um, post-heat losers, like interviews with losers too, which is yeah. something that they've kind of done intermittently in the past, but it's much more consistent now. And those are always telling. Yeah, I agree. Those are, those are the best ones actually. Why'd you yeah. lose? We know why the guy won. Why'd you lose? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, Tatiana Weston Webb, Tatiana Weston Webb's crying her eyes out, dude, after second round loss which is good like to see that she cares that much, but she just came off of a huge win at Margaret's. So real inconsistent performances and uh, that needs to be sewed up. <laughs> okay, go Tatiana, get it together, girl. Come on, come on, let's go. <laughs> yeah. All right, Scott, well, glad to have you back in the States. Glad you got yeah. uh, got some good waves under your belt. Congrats. Thank you, yeah. Um, I guess, oh, I do have a quick email I got um, regarding your podcast interview with John Pizel. It's one of the best you've done. He has so much to offer, so humble. And the flow between you two was beautiful. Wow, great, relaxed, precise interview, um, which is very nice. because. Uh, I had to read that because maybe he was sending that to you, not to me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the John Pizel interview in the Boardroom Podcast is apparently pretty good. And uh, go take a listen. Speaking of the Boardroom, coming up. Yeah, uh, September 25th and 26th at the Del Mar Fairgrounds. The Boardroom Surfboard Show presented by U.S. Blanks. And this year we're honoring Icon of Foam Pat Rawson in the Icon Foam Shape Off, Tribute to the Master Shape Off. There's going to be eight shapers replicating a classic Pat Ross and surfboard design. And of course, um, Pat will be there and uh, the entire surfboard manufacturing industry is going to be there. And we've got a, a packed floor of incredible exhibitors and um, seminars and all sorts of cool stuff. So we're excited. For everybody, we've been talking about surfboards or if you want to order one or buy one, um, there's a wait period and all that sort of stuff. Will people be able to purchase boards there? Absolutely. Okay, Tons sweet. of boards go through the doors there. Yeah. That'll be off, awesome uh, buying opportunities for surfboards, wetsuits, gear, leashes, fins, all of that stuff. On and people, a lot of the exhibitors I know build like boards specifically for the show, like showpiece type put a bunch yes. of time and effort into what they're bringing because obviously it's on display for the world to see. So um, absolutely come ready and willing to make yes. purchases. 
And then I would also argue, put a stop to your own spending, set a budget before you go, because you could walk out of there with more than you intended. <laughs> yeah, that's happened. That's happened before. So we're going to show we're excited about it. But one other thing I want to just quickly mention is the Headstock Guitar Lovers Festival happening in November in San Diego, a, a, a hall filled with beautiful surf, uh, beautiful guitars, amps, gear, accessories, and of course, live performances. So hopefully your dad will come down and check that out. We can talk pickleball. Yeah, I'll tell him. Yeah. Okay, until next time, David. Adios and aloha.